Hey everybody, it's Dr. Duncan again. Uh, we're still in Evolution 4, and now we're in Part 4, the Mesozoic Era. Um, and I'm going to warn you, this is a time of big, scary reptiles and even scarier events. So we got that to look forward to in the next couple minutes. Okay, so here we are in our timeline. Um, we've made a lot of progress. Um, we're now all the way over here at the... Um, at the beginning of the Mesozoic, this green uh, rectangle here representing the Mesozoic, and there's three periods in there, the Triassic, Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the, um, the details here, just kind of do some cherry picking and look at the most interesting things that happened during this time period. To begin with, um, remember that the, um, the beginning of the Mesozoic is... is um, is, is marked by the breaking up of the supercontinent of Pangaea. Remember, Pangaea was that supercontinent that was formed when Gondwana and Laurasia, two smaller supercontinents, collided. And remember that that collision caused the Appalachian Mountains to form. So we can thank um, that time period for why we've got iron ore and coal and limestone and many other types of rocks at the surface today uh, and here in the southeast and in Alabama in particular, as opposed to if the mountains had never formed, we would just have like one or two rock types at the surface and a much more boring ecology and many fewer species. Now this diagram here is illustrating um, some of the evidence that we have for these supercontinents. I hadn't talked about this yet. Uh, what you see in this map is um, taking the modern day outlines of some of the continents, four of them in particular, and showing where there are matching types of rocks. And in some cases, we've actually got matching fossils that are uh, of species that are found on one side of the ocean and found on the other side. So for example, there would be species of fossils here in South American rocks that are also found, in fossil, also found as fossils in rocks on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean in Africa. And of course, um, there's the whole Atlantic Ocean between um, these two continents now. No way for these land organisms to have been able to cross a saltwater large ocean. That helps give us some, some of, of the many lines of evidence that the continents had collided that long time ago to form Pangaea. Okay, so the Mesozoic lasts about 175 million years. Um, and like I said, it's marked, the beginning of which it's marked by the breakup of Pangaea. And when we look at a map of the Earth's surface, like we see down here below, it's starting to resemble what we see for the modern globe. The positions of the continents are moving into positions much similar to what we see today. Now, if you remember way back a few weeks ago when we talked about how new species are formed, we thought, talked about three different forms of speciation. Two of those forms of speciation fall under the category of cladogenesis, and one of those is called allopatric speciation. That's when you have a geographic barrier that prevents formerly united populations from interbreeding. They're now separated and they can't get to each other anymore. And so therefore, as those populations adapt and change through the process of natural selection and genetic drift and the other microevolutionary processes that cause change in allele frequency over time, those populations diverge more and more and more and become new species. So in the context of the Mesozoic, you can imagine that as these oceans are forming, and I'm going to draw some lines here to kind of represent that, it winds up splitting up formerly unified populations into these discrete populations that are no longer at actually able to get to each other and interbreed. And so for that reason, we have some groups of organisms that are only found in South America, or others that are only found in North America, or others that are only found in, in India, Antarctica, or Australia. So um, basically, the bottom line here is that at the early stages of the Mesozoic, there was a lot of allopatric speciation that was going on. Now, the Mesozoic might be my favorite um, era of, of them all because of just my childhood fascination with dinosaurs, large reptiles. And I know I'm not alone there. 
there's you know millions of kids that feel the same way. Uh, and so I got just a few pictures in here to capture some of that to just just simply to illustrate that um, this was a time period that was dominated by large animals in terms of the larger animals that were on the planet. But we also see popping up in the Mesozoic, we see some other organisms that emerge from the reptiles um, that have the, an the reptiles as their ancestors, um, but that are uh, different groups of organisms. So we see the first birds uh, begin to, or bird-like organisms begin to emerge in the, in the Mesozoic. And we even see the first mammals um, showing up in the Mesozoic. And a good reason, good, it's a good thing that these things were around uh, during the Mesozoic at the time of the dinosaurs for reasons we'll see in just a few minutes. Now, during the Mesozoic, the Earth was very warm. There was no ice on the planet, that, um, no, or at least we can't detect that from the rock record. We think that sea levels were very high. It was a very lush, warm, wet landscape on much of the Earth's surface that allowed a lot of ecosystems to thrive. And all that plant growth that was happening in tropical ecosystems all over the planet, even at latitudes that are now very cold, were very tropical. And all that plant growth supported a lot of herbivores, like you see here with uh, these big guys out here in this lake. And all these herbivores supported a lot of carnivores, like these little guys in the lower right that are looking pretty hungrily at this ginormous um, triceratops looking thing. Now, um, one of the things that happened in the Mesozoic that might not seem quite as exciting as large reptiles has to do with plant evolution. Most plants today that are dominating the Earth's surface are in a group that are called the flowering plants, or also known as the angiosperms. And they have, um, they have flowers that are much more complex, and they have other aspects of how they grow that allow angiosperms to grow in a great diversity of environments, from very dry, desert-like environments to very wet environments and everything in between. Prior to that, you had lots of, looking down here at the charts, you had lots of uh, ferns, and gymnosperms, which are basically our conifers, like our pine trees and our spruce and our fir and so forth. A group of plants known as the cycads. We uh, don't, those are, it's a tropical group. It's still in existence today, but we don't see any here in the Birmingham area. Ginkgos, like the Birmingham Southern's beloved stinky ginkgo trees. They were around many different species at the time. These are all uh, non-angiosperms. They're much more primitive plants in the way that they package up their, their um, their reproductive cells and, and uh, mate with one another. The angiosperms were very successful um, once they arose in the Mesozoic. And as you see with the chart, as you see with the chart here, the diversity of angiosperm species goes way up during the Mesozoic um, at the very high levels compared to was where it was in the uh, middle part of the Mesozoic. Meanwhile, other groups of plants are getting outcompeted. The ferns go down in number, the cycads go down in number, the gymnosperms go down in number as well. They're still around today, but not anything like the numbers that they had early on in the Mesozoic. One of the ways that the um, angiosperms were so successful is that they developed a lot of mutualistic relationships with pollinators and fruit-eating animals. Pollinators, um, animals that would move uh, the pollen from one flower to the, the flower of another plant, so that allowed for the uh, movement of plant genes across large distances where the wind wasn't sufficient to blow over those large distances. Uh, insects and, and later you know, birds and some mammals were able to move the, the pollen great distances. And that allowed um, the colonization or allowed these populations to spread into many areas. Fruit-eating animals that would eat the, um, the, the fruit created by angiosperms and then defecate out the seeds um, were able to help uh, uh, plants that, that were angiosperm plants like spread their seeds over large distances across the landscape. So the diversity of plants on the planet really increased. The number of species really increased with angiosperms. This was a form of adaptive radiation. We talked about that um, early on in the semester where you get one set of adaptations or, or one particular adaptation that allows one group of organisms to do a lot of speciation and become many different forms, much like we saw with Galapagos finches. One little finch blown out to those islands becomes 
eventually 13 different species that we have today. Okay, this slide is just to talk about dinosaurs briefly, to say that dinosaurs were just one group of large reptiles on the planet during the Mesozoic. They're defined by uh, certain skeletal issues that, I'm, that we're not going to get into for our class. There were other groups of organisms that were large dinosaurs, I'm sorry, that were large reptiles, but that are not called dinosaurs, uh, just to get technical about it. The dinosaurs themselves, they dominated um, a lot of the large uh, life on the planet for about 140 million years. Now, um, let's zoom in now to North America and see what was going on. Uh, this map over here to the right uh, shows that uh, in yellow and, and light green, this was land that was exposed during um, this, uh, the late Cretaceous, which was the tail end of the Mesozoic time period. And uh, the area that is light green or blue in between, that would have all been ocean. And you see, you see now that the North and South America, I'm sorry, North America was divided into a Western zone and an Eastern zone and separated by this Western interior seaway. Um, not coincidentally, that Western interior seaway, that lowland, of course, becomes the, Missis the, the, the basically the backbone of the Mississippi River Basin. Now, there's one other thing I want to point out about this map, and that is um, that this, is the, this time period is the origins of what's known as the fall line. So the fall line is a geographic line today, and I'm illustrating it here with the red line. It's a geographic division between the uplands of the southeastern United States and the lowlands. Uh, any area that's to the interior of the continent, closer to the mountains is the uplands. Anything that's closer to the ocean would be your lowlands or your coastal plain. And the reason this line, this demarcation exists is because the oceans, because they were so high at this time period, remember the Mesozoic was a very warm, tropical environment. There was no ice on the planet. Sea levels were very, very high. And essentially, um, the, those oceans wore down the Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachian Mountains had actually, um, before, had hooked all the way over here, um, back and forth up, across this, this zone, uh, many millions of, tens of millions of years before. But what happened during the... Um, during the, uh, as the oceans, as oceans rose during the Mesozoic, it essentially caused those mountains to uh, be eroded away. And in their place, you now have these, the coastal plain. These are basically seafloor sediments. So I want you to imagine at the time that this was all ocean, lower Alabama and parts of Georgia and all of Florida and Louisiana and so forth were all underwater, getting covered up by sediment that was washing down off of the um, eastern part of North America that was exposed as continent. Now this zone, this called the fall line, is important for several reasons. Culturally, it's important because as the first ex uh, Euro-American explorers came up the rivers, um, they were coming in by boat to explore the interior. It was along this line that they'd start to hit uh, rocks in the river and waterfalls and so forth, and they would have to stop traveling by water and switch to traveling by land. Um, th that's why the, the, the line is called the fall line, because that's the zone where waterfalls begin um, as you go upriver from the coast. And that was important culturally because it helped influence like where people, where um, Euro-Americans settled in the southeast. Um, and it also influenced, um, it has also influenced what species are found in the southeast. So some species are found only above the fall line, either on land or in the rivers, and some species are found below the fall line, closer to the ocean, because the environments are very different on either side of the fall line. And so that's yet one more reason why the Appalachian Mountains and Earth's deep history help explain why there's so many species in Alabama and some of the surrounding areas. Okay, so the uh, Mesozoic came to a very dramatic end about 65 million years ago when Earth was hit with an asteroid, a big asteroid. And this is our fifth mass extinction that we've seen in Earth's history. It's also known as the KT, or more recently known as the KPG extinction. The KT stands for Cretaceous Tertiary um, or Cretaceous of Paleogene um, extinction. It's the demarcation between 
uh, periods and subperiods. Now this asteroid that hit about 65 million years ago, we know now that it hit in an area of Mexico called the Yucatan, just offshore from the Yucatan. Hold on. Okay, sorry for the interruption. So the asteroid hit at about where the Yucatan is today. And this thing was, this was a, a huge asteroid. Um, it caused tremendous disruption to the entire Earth. Um, in the areas immediately um, hit by the, um, by the asteroid or next, right next to that, they were like the Earth's crust was vaporized within seconds. And nothing survived that. In areas even as far away as Alabama, they were, they were pounded by multiple uh, tsunamis that uh, radiated out from that part of the Gulf of Mexico. And we're talking about waves that were 50 to 100 meters tall. So that's you know, over 300 feet tall at their maximum that would have been washing against the uh, North American continent. Um, it would have been tremendously devastating to anything um, in the region um, as it went, when this thing hit, just within seconds. Now, what also happened, of course, was that um, other parts of the planet were impacted because um, that, that the asteroid hitting the planet with such force caused the ejection of lots of Earth's crust into the upper atmosphere as molten material, as liquid melted rock. And that material was basically on fire and hot as it radiated out like a mushroom cloud around the upper, around the Earth in the upper atmosphere and then began to rain down and fall on other parts of the planet. So you could have been on the completely opposite side of the planet uh, from the Yucatan and then several, I don't know if it was minutes to hours later, suddenly out of the sky, this molten ash would have started following. And as it hit the ground, it would have, been, it would have, it would have uh, started fires on anything that was flammable. So massive forest fires erupted around the world at this time period, um, even areas very, very far away from where the impact was. And we know this because we've got fossilized charcoal in the, in the rock and soil record from this time period. Um, now, what would have happened next would, have, would be that um, as with all this uh, material from the smoke as well as from the collision in the upper atmosphere, it would have darkened the sky for a long period of time, blocking a lot of sunlight. And of course, if you block the sunlight, you're cutting off the supply for the ecosystems that sustain life on the planet. So no sunlight means less plant growth. Less plant growth means that animals eating those plants are not able to survive as well. Um, so temperatures plummet, um, photosynthesis shuts down, things get really dark and grim for a long period of time. Long, whoops, long enough to cause the extinction of um, the dinosaurs and other large reptiles that were around at the time, as well as many, many other species. But fortunately, there were a few survivors. And in our last section of Deep Time, we're going to explore what happened to those survivors.